Siblings and sisters and brothers in Christ, welcome to Thursdays for the Soul. I am your host, Reverend Dr. Chris Davies, and I am so delighted to be here each week with all of you. Thursdays for the Soul is a webinar series that is consistent, and we hold up topics that care for the whole of the church and beyond. Everything from spirituality uh, and care of people to psalms and compassionate teachings, um, anything that's going to really center in your heart and what you need for what it is to be in the world today. Um, I want to say at the front end that every webinar we do is recorded and there's a playlist that you will receive in the follow up email if you've registered or if you're watching us on YouTube, you've already found that now. Um, and the resources that we mentioned will come up uh, in the follow up email or down below the YouTube as we go. So welcome. We are so glad that you are here with us. Today, we're going to be speaking together about sacred boundaries. Um, and I am joined by an esteemed panel of guests featuring Elita Wright, who is, has a master's in social work and is joining us again from Liberation UCC in Seattle. Good afternoon, everyone. It is good to be here again. And with this, as you said, esteemed panel, I look forward to hearing from everybody. Also, we are here with Reverend Jack Davidson, who's the senior pastor of Spring Glen UCC in Connecticut. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you, not as an expert in boundaries, but as a fellow uh, struggler on the journey, uh, as made uh, clear by the fact that I didn't keep to my own time boundaries and showed up 25 minutes late to the uh, time that I was supposed to sign on to this meeting today. So. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get to that, I'm sure. <laughs> we, we will. Don't worry. All, all is well and there is grace abundant. <laughs> we are also joined by Reverend Tara Barber, the Minister for Ministerial Support and Accountability here at the National Setting of the United Church of Christ. It's so good to be here with you all this afternoon. And even as a boundary trainer for years and years now, it's still a journey and an everyday decision about how to live into our boundaries. So this will be a good conversation for us today. Thank you, Chris, for having us. Absolutely. We are framing today's conversation in, in the, you know, I almost want to say the theology of boundaries or the, the sacred way in which we hold them. Um, so as we're doing that, I am curious for the panelists Two questions to start, and you can answer either or some portion thereof, is what does sacred boundaries mean to you? And when you think about your sa the sacred texts that we reach towards, what stories come up that you want to make sure we bring into this conversation? So we'll start with Alita. Sacred boundaries. My first thought was those set by God, of course. <laughs> Um, for me, that's where they come. Um, and then those set in communion with God, conversation. And those for me are malleable. Those for me change. Those for me are in the moment. Um, so I'm just thinking like this morning, a sacred boundary I set was... Um, and I considered it sacred and I was so pleased as I decided to take the day off. I was going to do this in the midst of my day, but I sent my boss a text a half an hour before work and said, I need this day. I'm in a place of limits. And so may I have this day? And she's like, of course. And I went and picked blackberries this morning <laughs> that, and I found myself talking to God and thanking God for the sacred and picking um, blackberries. So they're as simple or as broad as that for me. Yeah, for for me, uh, it's especially that word you just said, limits, is is an important one. Uh, because usually when we talk about boundaries, we talk about the ones we intentionally set, but there's also the boundaries that are just inherent in our uh, limits as mortal beings um, that we can't we physically cannot do everything, um, as I learned over and over again during this pandemic and today as well. Um, and uh, so I think adding the word sacred puts a little flip on it in that how do we intentionally create space for ourselves and for God? Um, and the tension between, uh, you know, 
so some not all boundaries are necessarily healthy boundaries uh not all boundaries not even religious boundaries are not sacred boundaries um and so yeah that's 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 where i'm living today is this question of how to create intentional space yeah, i really like that intentionality because i i feel like sometimes we talk about the divine spark as this big infinite thing that lives in us and that's true and you know, God created us as unique and individual, and um, and that means there's some limits to who we are and how we are in the world, and where our our spark bumps up against the other sparks in this place. So for me, this divine and sacred boundary is really attuning back to what, who, and what God has called us to be, and how we are to be in the world, and how we're we're not to be, um, where those edges are. And I love the, um, you know, the image of those edges because they often rub up against each other or overlap and then there's communication to be had and all of these various ways in which who I am as a human is in conversation with who you are as a human and God is part of it all to bring us back to what Alita centered us in in, in, her, in her description of, of um, what boundaries are. Um, I also am curious when you're thinking about it, if there's specific Bible stories that come up for you in thinking about where boundaries have been engaged. And hop in as you're ready. Uh, the one I'm thinking about in that sort of like, not all boundaries are sacred and not all religious boundaries are sacred uh, is, is the story of Jesus healing on the Sabbath day, and much to the horror and chagrin and, and of, you know, the anger of the religious leaders in that time um that they're like you're you, you can't heal on the sabbath that's not permitted and jesus says well like if your horse is thirsty you're gonna lead it to water right um that the intention of those boundaries is just in, as important of, as the boundaries and the uh, impact of the boundaries is just as important um that boundaries sacred boundaries are meant to help us heal and uh, rest and, and rejuvenate. And um, that sometimes we, we sort of have to constantly do that self-reflection around if these boundaries are uh, liberating me or constraining me. Um, or, and, and also the impact on others around us, right? Because Jesus breaks the boundary to help somebody else. Um, are these boundaries uh, causing injustice in the world and causing harm to others? Um, or are these boundaries uh, helping lift everybody up? Yeah, we've been talking about the storms in the boat. And so I was thinking about the story about where Jesus is sleeping and the boat is being wrecked by a storm and the disciples are freaking out and um, and they say, wake up and, and, and calm the storm. And I think, you know, what I'm taking from that today is this sense that there'll be times when we can sleep, even if it is stormy outside. And there'll be other times when absolutely our invitation is to, to stand up and do what we can do to bring as much calm around us as we can bring. And I'm so grateful that there are, there are stories in the Bible about rest, right? About Jesus going away and resting, about him um, saying to the disciples, no, I'm not going to feed these people. You feed them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's something that you're called to do. I'm not called to do that in this moment. And even from the very beginning in Genesis, that, um, that God rested in between each of the days. That, you know, that's part of our story and our fabric around, around pausing and resting and saying that it's good. And I think we do need that balance of acting and inacting. Um, and I'm grateful that we have the, the stories that um, give us a foundation for that. I love that. I love both of those. And what came to mind for me this morning was Jesus and Gethsemane. We have this picture that if, and I'm laity, so I know I'm not the only one that thinks sometimes that my pastor should be there for me all the time. <laughs> I have a need. God knows I have a need. God told my pastor, so my pastor's there. <laughs> but um, he went into that garden. I was reading it again this morning and he needed time. He, as the lead in this role, needed time and he took it. And he asked only a couple of things of his folks and they couldn't quite do it. But again, he said, 
he set the boundary and went back to what he needed to do. And so that was, that's what's in my mind. What I love about both of those examples, I, and neither of those stories I would have associated with boundaries because so I think, so my natural assumption is that boundaries are about saying I can't. Um, but both of those stories were, were uh, one, Jesus saying, this is what I need. And one, Jesus empowering somebody else to do something, um, which is, you know, it's such an interesting model for, for boundary setting um, that I, I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to be sitting with that for a while. I love that idea, especially as somebody who it often avoids delegation because it feels so much easier sometimes just I'm just going to take care of it myself it's going to take so much more time for me to try to recruit somebody to put the meal together um and instead Jesus is like here's five you know some loaves and fishes you figure it out right <laughs> that's a I love that in terms of a model for boundary setting I think there's something crucial, crucial in what Alita said too, because there's the, you know, the boundaries we set for ourselves and the expectations we hold for others' boundaries. Um, and, and that's some of what I heard in, in how you were speaking um, in that particular way. And um, so I wanna lift that up as well, because I know that in, in some of the conversations that we've had and in some of the ways that we've addressed this in our previous conversation on boundaries, which will be available to you in the resources thereafter, um, that Tara, you've spoken before about a holy no. And I'm wondering if you can speak more about what that is and can be for clergy and lay folks both in this time. Oh, yes. And and I know um, I'm feeling it. I mean, I imagine you're feeling it too, this um, place of, of, of overwhelm these days or kind of this endless um, uh, extended time of not knowing how to navigate and the decisions are big and, will this ever return to something that feels um, more normal or less intense? And so I think it's even more important to talk about this holy no, um, because what I'm, what I'm sensing is that there are places that it feels like we can't say no, right? We can't say no when there's a child who needs our attention, who needs to be fed, who needs, you know, we can't say no if it's a crisis. We can't say no, you know, it feels like there are these places that have come up and said, well, I've, I've set these great boundaries for myself about when I work and when I rest, but now I'm living with my family in a house and, and I don't get to keep those boundaries in the way that I used to be able to. You know, my bedroom is also my office and how do I shift from one to the other and how do I keep that no? Um, and I, I, think, um, I think this negotiating that we were just talking about that Jeff lifted up and about, you know, okay, so if I can't say no, can I say, um, this is how I'm gonna respond. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, partner with somebody to help me respond. Or I'm gonna say, you know, for this moment, I'm gonna respond in this way, may not be ideal, but this is what I can <clears throat> give to this situation in this moment. Um, because I think that part of that holy no is being able to protect and preserve who we are and who God has called us to be. And so what are those places where there are the absolutes? Um, and where are those places where we have to attend, even if our preference would be to say no? And where are those places where we can um, fully engage in that yes and no as, as we wish? And I think this time of pandemic and this time of, of um, increased and uncovered um, racial violence and all that's happening in our world with literally hurricane and fires and, um, and, and all that's swimming around us. Um, we need to be able to carve out some spaces for ourselves to, to be, to rejuvenate, to um, be able to recenter so that we can say yes again. So that holy no allows us to say yes. Yeah, I mean, as you're, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm noticing my own self recognize the level of everything you've just named and I need to take a breath and come down and come into the conversation with awareness that um, we, cannot, we cannot be in the yes without spaces for the no, as you've just said. Um, I'm curious, Tara, if you can speak to some of the self-sacrifice that is often called um, out of us in, in the yes and the yes and the yes. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, a, good, I'm a good pleaser. I'm a good, um, you know, I, I grew up to be a good girl in that respect. That was there some gendered expectations around how to be there on behalf of others. And certainly ministry is a call that 
um, asks us, invites us, demands us sometimes um, even to be there on behalf of. And I think that's uh, a good and holy call and there are some limits. And I think even Jack referenced these too, right? About where's the extent of that? Um, where is, does my acting on behalf of or my um, sacrificing my needs for yours turn into something that looks like um, saviorism, white saviorism even, that looks like um, martyrism, that looks like um, really um, a, a perverted way of, of expressing love in the world. Um, and so I think we can't figure that out if we don't have time to check back in, to hear that still small voice inside, to call us back into who we are. Um, I had a spiritual director that I know, I think I said this last time, that talked about being right-sized. And I have loved that image that, you know, if I go into a situation either too big or too small, I'm at risk of doing harm. And so the more I can be fully in who I am and who God calls me to be and in relationship so that I can find out where the boundaries are for you and not just assume that mine are the same as yours, I think the better able I'm able to actually be in, in true service to one another without sacrificing what's essential. Does that help? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking and I'm over here hooting and hollering like, wow, that's profound. That there's there's some profound boundaries of care that are there that are um, you know continued lessons for all of us. Um, I'm I'm thinking about there is a um, an Instagram account um, called the Nap Ministry um, who is run which uh, is run and um, just incredible content. I'm going to kind of circle back around to that towards the end of the conversation, but how is it that we are caring for ourselves in the midst of everything? And we are not alone in that caring for ourselves. Um, some of the stories that each of you have brought up were about Jesus and how he was doing that kind of work and setting the boundaries um, for himself in service to the world. Um, and, you know, thinking through some of these conversations, um, I'm wondering about this um, posturing of radically inclusive Jesus. Um, so um, in thinking through that, Alito, specifically to you, I'm wondering how did his humanity show through uh, in the breaking of societal boundaries um, in terms of the rest and, and all of the limits that he is holding in such a way that he can continue to do the work? Well, I remember a story of Jesus talking about the woman caught in, well, the story of the woman caught in adultery, that was one. And for the time, and I think it's still true today, um, there are some acceptable norms and there are some people who know what they are, whether they break them or not, they still hold them for others. Sometimes the higher up you are, the more power you have to hold them in place. And Jesus's response was classic. He didn't say a lot, but he said, any of you who haven't, please start this. And that, I don't think we have that even today in many of our churches. Like we have so many places and we call them sacred boundaries. And in so doing, try to shut other people up. And I th think that Jesus, that was a radical thing for him to do that. Um, talking to the woman from Samaria, that was outside of his community. And yet he had that conversation and he, there's just, again and again, places where he did what he was supposed to do, and he set a new boundary in so doing. And I, that's my lead. That's who I want to follow. I hope that gets to it. For sure. Um, I know that we've been talking a little bit about some of this societal norm as a boundary. And I think that we can tease that out a little bit more um, because I think that the norms that are then, the norms then that Jesus were, was in conversation with were dictated by the societal power structures of the day. Similarly, the norms now that we are in conversation with are understood via the logic of white supremacy. 
you know, there's these, these tenets that we know that like there's perfectionism as an ideal, you know, and one of the things we consistently say in trying to lean out of the expectations and the norms that is present is like, we do not expect perfection, we expect presence, you know, something like that. Um, and Tara, you've been having some conversations about this difference between crossing or violation of boundaries. And I'm curious how you're teasing that out in awareness of all of the various power structures that are present today imposed upon us versus the ways in which we can choose uh, and have power over our own boundaries. Yeah. yeah, I think it's an important distinction because um, to have an intimate or close relationship, we have to cross some boundaries, right? We have to get into each other's spaces and we have to do that only with consent. So that's, you know, that would be an, a crossing that would be appropriate and good and important and essential even for ministry. And then when we talk about boundary violations, those are times when either there wasn't consent, whether it wasn't asked for or it was denied or it was, you know, ambiguous. You know, those are all no's <laughs> about consent. Um, and so a violation happens when a boundary is crossed in a way that wasn't invited, that wasn't assented to. Um, and, um, and for us, it, it sometimes gets to be a jumble. It gets all caught up in there. And, um, and the only way we're gonna be able, again, to tease this apart is to be in conversation, to be able to say to the, you know, to the, even the Twitter, right? Um, okay, this is what's being presented as reality. My, my understanding, if this were me, it would be that this was a violation. It's being presented as normal. It's being presented as this is what happens in our world. And that may be true, but actually what else is happening is that a boundary has been violated. Harm has been done. Um, uh, someone did not assent or consent to this behavior happening. Um, and and it, uh, we can't really escape the all of the messages that we get from the world about how we're supposed to be and where the boundaries are and who gets to set them. Um, so it's important then for us even more so to be able to have a dialogue, have a conversation. I know I'm so grateful that Jack um, said yes to this conversation because um, it's a brave thing for us to enter into this, um, you know, as male and female identified because we're so um, shaped by gendered norms in our society around boundaries. So I'm grateful that we can, um, we can have this more expansive conversation today. Well, I'm thinking and listening to both of you speak, there were a couple of times I wanted to jump in, but also wanted to recognize I tend to be somebody who like jumps into a conversation and oversteps and like cuts people off. And so trying to hang back and, and hear your wisdom, uh, because that, that point you just made about who gets to set the boundaries is, is, is crucial in terms of my engagement in a, in a group as a straight white cis, relatively able-bodied human being, right? Uh, that I historically got to set all the boundaries. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, the, the culture set those boundaries for me. Um, and so like I think about earlier, Tara, you were talking about like, how do you deal with the anxiety of all the headlines and the fires and the racism and everything going on? And, and uh, you know, there's often memes about like, you know, just turn the news off sometimes, right? But there's there's a huge element of privilege in setting that boundary for me as a white male, right? Or that, uh, you know, I, I can turn off conversations about racism, uh, but that's not true for a lot of people of color. Um, it's just part of their existence. And um, so those, those uh, models that you offered, Alita, before, about how Jesus broke broke uh, unjust boundaries were really helpful for me in terms of saying like, oh, Jesus modeled for us how to use privilege to stand up for other people's uh, compassion to compassion for other people. Um, and, but then there's going back to what you were saying about making sure we're not entering into the white savior complex. Um, huge, huge. And, and the, so for me, the thing I've been sort of battling with is in this pandemic world, I mean, even before the pandemic hit, the, the sort of work-life balance thing was, was this huge struggle and the pandemic just amplified it, right? Um, and, you know, and, and in some ways what makes it difficult 
on the male side is different than what it, it makes it difficult for the female identifying side is that historically those uh, and culturally those boundaries were set for me right like there was no expectation for me to be help helping in the household traditionally uh, but now as to uh, to earn our homes are more and more common um, and uh, the culture is shifting towards shared parenting responsibility that creates this tension that is really hard to resolve. And like all of the studies are showing that the pandemic is putting way more burden on uh, women in heterosexual relationships, um, that they're, that women in heterosexual relationships are taking on so much more of the burden of caring for the children while ba balancing their full-time work. Um, and uh, so some of the boundary setting that is needed from myself and, uh, you know, all my fellow white, straight, cis men who are parents uh, is to sacrifice our work and sacrifice our career. And uh, in order to share that in that responsibility, but it's not just sort of the setting those time limits and boundaries. It's also doing the emotional work of what Chris was talking about before about perfectionism and letting go like the <sighs> implementing those boundaries requires accepting uh, lower quality work in some ways because we can't just dig into our work and ignore everything else. Uh, when when the pandemic hit, um, the, our, our neighbors uh, had created this two hour system. They would trade off two hours parenting and homeschooling, two hours at work. My wife and I are, because I'm a minister and she's a social worker, it didn't feel like we could really do that. And so we traded off days. So I had to give up full days of work um, and add an extra day where I just wasn't working and, and just be okay with that and trust that my congregation was going to be okay with that because that's what my family needed. And for me, my hope was that I was also modeling for them the, the grace that we need to extend to people during this pandemic. Um, that, that, you know, a lot of think pieces came out early on about how like we shouldn't this is a traumatic, a collective traumatic experience. We shouldn't be expecting the amount of productivity that capitalism usually demands of us. Uh, and so forgiving myself for not being the most amazing minister ever. Um, but then the struggle was then I ended up pulling a bunch of all-nighters <laughs> in order to make up for the work that I missed. And so I set a healthy boundary but I offset it with an unhealthy lack of boundary, um, and, which that that's always that's part of the struggle is, you know, like, oh, I'm pushing towards vacation time. So I'm overworking so that I feel comfortable unplugging. Uh, and then I'm overworking when I come back and that offsets like I actually don't feel rested because I, I stepped away um, because I offset that with like, what if what does it look like for us to just drop everything instead of overworking so that we can step away. Um, it's, it's, that's a huge piece. And, and as you named earlier, there's a lot of gendered implications and culture in there. I wanna to speak to some of that um, gendered stuff explicitly because the last time that we had a conversation that was centered on boundaries, as some of you may remember, um, it was between me and Alita and Tara, and it was an incredible conversation um, diving into boundaries and power and how that all shows up. Um, and one of the comments that we got consistently was, um, how come there's not a man on this panel? So um, Tara, I'm gonna ask you to kind of speak into that with your experience of doing boundary trainings consistently. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, um, I've been a part of uh, certainly conference boundary trainings, but then also more involved in the denominations um, boundary trainers, and it is predominantly women who are doing the boundary training, um, not exclusively, and I'm grateful for, <laughs> for my male colleagues who are engaged in this work as well, but I think there is something about the expectation on women to keep boundaries, to set boundaries and keep boundaries, and it's a mixed message because on the one hand, I expect to um, be the ones that say no and stop. And I don't like that, but 
also we're expected not to have those boundaries, not to say those things. Um, and so when we get in these settings of, um, of talking to one another and, and raising them in a mixed um, gendered um, uh, class or whatever it, it turns out to be, um, it's difficult to talk across the gender and across the expectations. Um, and you know, my, I'm really grateful that the, in some ways the veil is being lifted on this to be able to say, you know, for Jack to see what I've experienced as a parent and a, and a, um, and a minister, you know, for the last, you know, however many years, right? That tension between doing it all and um, um, perfection and um, uh, where I have to give um, and how we share the work. Um, and I feel like some of that is, is happening as well around race. And I, you know, I, Jack raised something about emotional labor and Anita or Alita and I had this little bit of conversation already today about, you know, how do we engage in this um, uh, revealing of the veil without expecting someone else to do this emotional labor of, well, tell me how it really is for you, you know, Tell me how it really is for you as a lesbian woman, or tell me how it really is for you as a as a black lesbian woman. Tell me how you know that that work um, is essential and it's it's um, fraught with some um, maybe unfair expectations on one another. So I just want to lift that as part of this. It's really complex and it's really essential. Well. I was thinking, I mean, I, that has been on my mind um, in the last few months. Uh, and boundaries, people in times of crisis, it turns out, can even hold on to the fact that there are boundaries for a moment. <laughs> and then their need for answers can cross that boundary, even as they're explaining that they're crossing that boundary. And then it becomes on me it like to, to, to determine whether I will accept that crossing of boundary, whether I will acknowledge it in that moment or if I will come back to it later. So in the last few months, I, in terms of that boundary and I would have thought sacred, I had sacred boundaries. Um, my life is full. I live like two or three lives like most of us in a 24 hour period but there were times for being off or they were boundaries that I set. With what's been going on lately, people have felt and needed more support. And it, like I said, it has been, I know this isn't your responsibility as a black woman. I know this is not, that this is crossing a boundary as a name, whatever it is. Um, and what do I do? Um, I think in that moment, it's even more important for me to check in with God. Like I have to be flexible. I'm, that's my decision I've made um, as an African heritage woman, as a lesbian, to make my boundaries move as needed to meet need. But I'm learning, and maybe it's because I'm aging I'm learning that I have not only limits, but I want those limits kept. Um, and I have support. One of the way of keeping boundaries I'm learning is to have people in there to remind you that you have set a boundary. Um, and in these times, the other piece I wanted to mention, it goes back to both my stuff and what you mentioned, Jack, around perfectionism, um, gender role socialization being what it is. There is this expectation of perfectionism for men in particular, but also just in that white supremacy culture, the boundaries of that say that this is what's required and meeting it being anything less than makes you or us less than. And I think part of my question and challenge here is, is that a sacred boundary? It has been till now, and we have representation around us that are naming it as such, but is that in alignment and harmony with what God would have 
humanity do not you me or anybody else but just in general it does that line up with you know love the word you know love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second end of this is to love your neighbor as yourself does that boundary is that still a true boundary today um yeah I love that you're raising that question because I've heard you say in previous conversations um, that naming that boundaries are porous and we can make choices about them each day. Um, and I'm thinking about some some boundaries, some some limits that I have are hard boundaries. Like this is a hard boundary. I will not adjust on this. And other ones that I carry for myself are more soft, soft boundaries, soft limits. Um, you know, this is something that there's there's some adjustment depending on circumstance. Um, and sometimes when I'm even, I'm thinking about how I block my work schedule because like work right now is, uh, pretty much what I have access to like many of you. Um, and you know, if I have a block of time set off that I'm going to be writing, um, how will on a scale of one to 10, how willing am I to have that be interrupted by meetings? And sometimes that's the way that I think about these things is that this is a time boundary, um, back to the limits that we've mentioned before. Um, so I'm curious, um, thinking through that, um, when we think about boundaries, um, for whom, the boundaries for whom piece is one of the things that, that has come up um, in, in, in several ways. Um, and what are the moments where our boundaries become really porous? Um, you know, what are the things we're willing to compromise about in, in awareness of those boundaries? So uh, I, sorry if I appear distracted. I've been walking away from the screen to look out the window because we just got slammed by the like biggest winds I've seen in, in ages uh, outside. And huge, and like my neighbor's tree came down into our yard as we were talking. And uh, but for it sort of is a very relevant uh, analogy for what you were just talking about because uh, the the trees that stand and stay standing aren't necessarily the strongest trees or the healthiest trees they're the trees that can bend in the wind a little bit right and I, there's even that that scripture passage about reeds uh that can bend in the wind versus reeds that that just break um and uh but uh you know it's what what kind of uh that the question about porous boundaries is uh, like what are we willing to bend for um and for, for me, uh, you know, the, the things that I usually set as my like thresholds for like, don't reach out to me for unless it's this or like definitely reach out to me if like my days off the things that I let infiltrate those days off are usually death and justice issues. Um, death because that's that's so big that like, it, it's sort of inhumane for me to ignore that as a pastor. Um, but it, it also it implies a sort of seriousness of this boundary. Um, the justice things are, are about, uh, you know, like uh, I, I am not a good ally if I'm sort of setting the boundary for my engagement, if that makes sense. I, that like, if, if, I, if I dictate the schedule of when and how a protest happens, uh, that is me exerting my sort of a white supremacy culture. Um, and so that that is something I, I think that also uh, is is meant to communicate and model for my community and for the people I'm trying to be an ally with the sincerity of these issues um, that, uh, you know, a, a, the the trauma of uh you know uh, black people being murdered by police and 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 the the sort of impact of racism on society is is so such a crucial topic right now um that it is imperative for me as a white community leader to engage in that um uh, even if that means sacrificing some of my own time, because that, that is the work of, of privilege is letting go of some of those 
uh, some of those privileges, right? My privilege to be able to take a day off, um, it, right? There, there are a lot of people in a lot of lines of work who don't get that privilege. Um, and um, part, of, part of the work is standing up, or, uh, is, is coming alongside those people um, and, and to be able to hear them out um that i show up both to provide presence but also to hear to to hear them right and that's 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 the ministry of jesus right the uh emmanuel like god with us right being with each other providing presence for each other i'm gonna take a breath holding all of these various pieces you know we've brought up so many critical pieces that i feel like for me i'm gonna need to take a step back and think about the little things each one of you has raised that's helped me think differently about my boundaries and how I'm showing up in the world. Um, and I also want to raise some of the questions that have come through uh, in the midst of everything. So um, the um, one of the things I want to lift up is, is there's these conversations about pastoral boundaries and how lay folk and pastors are in conversation about those boundaries together. So um, one person is saying, how can I help other congregation members respect our pastor's time off? I know they text, email, and call him on his day off, and he's so nice that he, he's so nice he doesn't stop them, but I worry that he burns out. And I see a lot of things happening in that question, but I'm going to pass it to our professional boundary trainer for clergy, Reverend Tara. <sighs> Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> and can I just start by saying um, we're talking about this in a time that's so less than ideal, so not um, not right in so many ways. And we're talking about this in terms of in an institution that cannot be sustained in the way that it has been. So I, I think that's part of the deep breathing here is to say, okay, these are unusual times and unsustainable times. So what can we do for ourselves, for our clergy to tend to the needs, the crises, as Jack said, the crises, um, and, um, and be as kind and gentle with each other for the rest of it. Um, and so I think, you know, this, uh, these boundary settings and congregations can't just rely on the pastor saying, I have a boundary, especially when that pastor is, as you said, so nice that they'll keep breaking their own boundaries to to respond on their on their time off. But it's up to the whole community, the whole faith community, to be able to attend to the boundaries, to be able to lift that up as a cultural norm, to say, you know, we all have limits, and um, and I'm going to do my part to respect the limits of of you and of our pastor, and that's going to be part of our conversation: is how do we name the places where we need space and where we can create that for each other, um, where we can tend to one another, right? To say. Gosh, I, you know, I have a need for for conversation now. Maybe it's not a need for the pastor to engage with me. Maybe there's a, a lay pastoral care team, or there's other folks that I can turn to. You know, I'm really hopeful that that one of the things that comes out of this time is this deeper sense of community. That we cannot continue to be everything to everybody as an individual. That we need each other to really be the body of Christ. So I'm grateful that you're raising that question on behalf of your um, congregation. And, and really, it's going to take all of us risking saying, gosh, maybe we should think twice before we email on a day off. Um, you know, that's a boundary I'd like for me on my day off, you know, just to begin to model that. Yeah. I, you know, there it goes to another another question that came in about um, a pastor saying that she has a she has a boundary that she is not going to return to to in church in church worship until there is uh, a vaccination found and um, there's that's caused some conflict within her church um, and I want to name that because we are in a time where who we are as humans and how we interpret the world is coming up against one another in ways that are not always productive and they are always amplified, always amplified by the current reality of our circumstance. Um, so, you know, thinking through that, I'm reminded of the conversation we had just a couple of days ago um, about, um, you know, 
essentially we the conversation was called supporting your pastors so they can support you and it's available in the recordings um, which has been posted in the chat for all of you watching or on the playlist as you see it on youtube um, and the um, thing i want to lift up is the pastor as a whole human person um, which uh, has a couple of different implications for what i'm hearing in this conversation as well um, the pastor is the whole human person, um, has some responsibility to communicate those boundaries as you are aware of them. And we are not always, because sometimes boundaries we find as we stumble into them once they've been crossed. Like that is a truth. Um, and then there's a responsibility of the people who, once the communication has been made clear, um, then have their own stuff to choose to engage with. And that's a culture setting, culture setting question, um, just as Reverend Tara just said. Um, so, you know, in, in thinking through that, I'm curious what thoughts the, the three of you may have to add into that um, about, um, you know, anything that's coming up for you in conversation with these boundaries and is particularly how they play out for congregations. I'll jump. I'm not seeing either of you two <laughs> jumping. I, no, I... Um... I do want to lift that up, Chris, that um, there are, we're hearing more and more about churches where, um, where there are threats to a pastor's um, position because of the boundaries they've set around, um, around opening, reopening in, in the pandemic. Um, and there are increasing numbers of clergy who are wondering, who are discerning, is this still the call for me? And I want, I want to name that um, clearly. And and I have some grief about that, quite a bit of grief about that actually, um, because I think it does reflect um, our inability to, <clears throat> to, um, to hold each other as full human beings um, and to hold the, um, to preserve, to shape, the, to set aside the importance of, of our health and, and well being as essential, not set it aside, but set it as as essential, so that we can be then in relationship and in in the role. Um, I, you know, I'm curious to hear what what Jack and Alita would say as pastor and parishioner. I'm I'm in this <laughs> different place now in the in the church life. I, I think there's. Um... There's an there's an interesting piece that I've seen both in church life and in like school systems uh, about the um, expectation of uh, to to serve people the way they want to be served. Um, so, for instance, I've seen uh, you know and there was this initial outburst of appreciation for teachers, and then over the summer that shifted, and and some people who were dissatisfied started to speak up more, and who who felt like they didn't get th that that the online system did not work for their kids, and they were starting to blame teachers and administrations for that, um, and. Uh, they, like they just couldn't comprehend like this seems so easy like you should be able to create this amazing online experience um i'm so disappointed that you failed us right like it's amazing how sometimes when setting boundaries feels like failure both for the people receiving like on the receiving end of the boundary and for the people setting like I, I feel like I failed you all today because I showed up late because I had to you know get my daughter home and was trying to finish my sermon recording you know like I am constantly battling this sense of failure um, but as people are criticizing our teachers I am holding in analogy my experience shifting to online worship where um, content creation is a very different skill set than community leadership. Uh, it, it is, I, and, and so I wanted to make sure our community was holding in grace our employees because they were not hired for the jobs that they've been doing. Just like our teachers were not hired for the jobs that they are doing. They were hired because they have a skill for in-person education. And our staff members were hired because they have a skill for in-person uh, ministry. And to expect an immediate flip to this completely different uh, 
skill set is just absurd and inhumane, <laughs> um, or not inhumane, so I may be strong, uh, inconsiderate, right? I think it's some of uh, everybody's own anxieties pouring out and, and finding a scapegoat, right? Like our, I am upset because online learning didn't work for my child. I don't know where to put that upset, so I'm putting it, I'm putting it on you. Um, I am upset because I don't feel connected to my church community and how, how dare, like, look at all these other churches that are holding outdoor worship space. I'm going to put that on. You are making a strategic error as opposed to you as a trusting you as a pastor to have assessed the situation, not only for our health uh, concerns and our health needs, but also for our capacity as a church, right? Like for, for instance, I, uh, new, uh, it, it, when we first shifted to online, I kept saying like, well, if I take my vacation as I normally do and my associate kept being like, no, when you take your vacation, like you normally do, right? <laughs> and, when, and, and part of that is I knew that me taking vacation meant that we could not take greater risks in order to gather together, right? I, I could, I as a full-time senior pastor could not put on my part-time employees to hold outdoor worship services because of the amount of work it takes to shift our model to, to in that way. Um, it, it, sort of acknowledging that not every institution has the same capacity or same space or same uh, uh, vulnerabilities, um, that, that it, it's important that if people aren't making choices that you want them to make, it's, it's not because they are failing, it's because they have they're, they're trying, you know, like they're trying to balance all of those boundaries and their abilities and the community's ability um, and needs and, and God's need for us, right? Um, yeah. Ooh, there was a lot of chat response to that and a lot of question response to that. So thank you for speaking those things aloud, Jack. Um, Alita, I'm really curious about what, you know, what it is that you are carrying and holding into this place as well. Well, what came to me as you asked the question and as I last listened to Tara and Jack talk was Noah. Um, we, my understanding is that Noah didn't, like at that time, people didn't necessarily know what rain was, but he said there's going to be a flood. And he took action based on that as a leader, as a man of God. And people thought that he was out of his mind. People jeered him. People, I mean, they didn't respect him. And so we know the story goes, it was his family that was the one that survived. But the opportunity, I mean, God gave opportunity after opportunity to say, if you, if, if it works, like, find somebody that'll go with you. And so I think in this time of pandemic, that's what's, as you all talk, that's what came to my mind. I happen to trust God first. And I happen to trust and be in fellowship with a church and a man of God that I trust. If those two make that decision, never mind the CDC, because that could change at any moment, depending upon the tenured person making a decision about who makes the rules and stuff. But if I trust them, then I'm going to, there's a place where as a member of the congregation, I have to go, thus saith the Lord. The man of God has spoken. I trust that. Um, so it, those were the things that seemed really important for me as a congregant to remember. I placed my faith, a piece of my faith life in the hands of this person. Worldly things do not take it away. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you said that about Noah too, because what I was thinking of was that metaphor of building the airplane while flying it. You know, we, we referenced that before that that's what um, we've had to do in this pandemic time is, is build it while we're in it. But nobody ever talks about the risk of that, right? Because the risk if you don't build it well while you're flying is that we crash. I mean, I think that's the weight that that's on um, pastors for sure, but also on so many of us that there's so much pressure to do this um, right and well. 
you know, so that we don't crash, so that we don't cause one another harm, so that we don't get each other sick, you know, so that, so that, so that. Um, and so I just think that was great that you had, you had Noah in the boat and I had the airplane. So we're, we're doing this mm. thing. <laughs> you beloveds, you brilliant leaders in this conversation. First, thank you for, for displaying elements of your own boundaries to be in the conversation, um, and to be present with us today. I know this is ongoing work. Um, and there are questions that we will not have time to get to in the midst of this, um, we, though, for those of you who are present with us now or, you know, as you're watching this later now for you, um, we wrote some specific prayers and blessings for you um, about boundaries. So before they are offered, um, I do want to say that this is part of the ongoing work of the National Setting of the United Church of Christ, and you can support that work by texting UCC to 41444. And that will go into the annual fund and the ongoing work of the National Setting of the United Church of Christ, including programs like this. Um, I also want to say that there's in, some incredible stuff coming up next week. The first is on Tuesday, we're going to screen the movie Suppressed and talk about voter suppression and what you and your congregation can do and how you will engage your vote to make a difference. Um, in alignment with your faith, let me be clear. And then uh, a week from today, uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman will be in conversation with Sister Simone from the Nuns on the Bus talking about being driven by faith. Um, so join us when you come there. And now with a deep breath and with a gracious offering of some boundary prayers, um, I'm gonna invite the panelists to speak aloud these prayers and they will come out to you in writing um, and you can use them liberally thereafter, um, whether personally, professionally or in your congregations. But here are some prayers that we've written for you. Oh, God, ouch, that wasn't okay. What happened here crossed a boundary for me and I'm not okay. Help me communicate effectively what support I need. Help me to recover the best version of myself and help me find the words to name it clearly. Hold me and help me stitch myself back together so that I may be fully in my power and present to what you have called me to do in this world. Amen. Uh, a prayer for when boundaries are voiced. God, I am so grateful for the strength, strength to say what is okay and not okay. I am grateful to witness that strength in others and do my best to communicate effectively where my own boundaries are in a way that holds space for others as well. As we identify our boundaries, help us to speak them through. Where the boundaries surprise us, where the boundaries rub up against another person's, help us to come to resolution through you and through the support of our community. Help me to hold myself and another in grace through communication. Amen. May you be blessed with an internal compass for what's okay and what's not okay. May you be blessed with a community that helps orient you beyond your own compass through God who knows all of our hearts. May you be blessed with awareness of the strength of your boundaries and priorities. May you be blessed through God who loves you exactly as you are, recognizes what you need and moves with you in a place where the boundaries for all are heard, validated, and held as essential. May your boundaries keep you fully in your power and abilities centered in your divine gifts and helping to create space for others to be lifted as well. Amen. Amen. And may you all be blessed into your day knowing that you are not alone and you are a beloved child of God. Amen.